Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the third in our series of webinars exploring improvement science and organised by the Health Foundation. My name is Bill Lucas. As well as coordinating the Improvement Science Fellowship Scheme, it's my pleasure to be facilitating this webinar. Our subject today is heterogeneity and our speaker is Frank Davidoff. Frank is a prolific thinker, researcher, author and practitioner. In his distinguished career, he has been Senior Vice President for Education at the American College of Physicians and editor of the Annals of Medicine. Currently, Frank is Executive Editor for the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and a member of the Health Foundation's International Improvement Science Development Group. The format of our webinar is that Frank will speak for about 45 minutes and will then respond to questions I will ask him. So, I need all of you please to send me questions while he is speaking. Just a reminder that we hope you have already had the chance to download Frank's BMJ quality and safety paper on this topic. And another reminder that if you want to access Frank's slides, visit the registration site and click on the downloads tab. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm virtual welcome to our speaker today, Frank David. Oh, Thanks, Bill. Hello and welcome to everyone. I'm pleased to be here and, and you'll be glad to know that if you're hoping to spend the next hour or so thinking about heterogeneity, you come to the right place. Heterogeneity is a big and complicated topic, so we'll get right down to business. First, I think it's important for everyone to be on the same page when we talk about heterogeneity. <clears throat> And a good way to accomplish that, uh, I thought, would be to look at the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of the word, which is composition from diverse elements or parts or multifarious composition. Now, I know that you know that heterogeneity is to be found everywhere in medicine, and it's present in clinical research, in quality improvement, and most importantly, in daily clinical practice. But you may or may not be aware of a serious problem with heterogeneity, which I see as follows. And that is, you can't live with it, and you can't live without it. So here's the territory we're going to cover today. First, using clinical research as the example, we'll get into the question of why it's hard to live with heterogeneity. And that's mainly because it gets in the way of documenting cause-effect relationships. And second, we'll talk about <clears throat> excuse me, why it's hard to live without it. And that's mainly because it's a unique source of deep knowledge about therapeutic effectiveness. And when I mean, say therapeutic, I'm talking about therapeutic in the best sense, in the broad sense of the impact of any medical intervention, whether it be a test, a drug, or a device, or a procedure. And third, we'll talk about how the effects of heterogeneity play out in improvement science. And then we'll end by talking about how we can manage the effects of heterogeneity. Now, I first began to deal seriously with the heterogeneity problem in the 1990s when I took over as the editor of uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. Now, Annals had a proud legacy of publishing high-quality clinical research. And so we worked hard to build on that legacy by developing what we thought of as a lean, mean, control trials publishing machine. Because along with most clinical researchers, I was convinced, and I'm still convinced, that uh, true experimental study methods, mainly controlled clinical trials, are our most powerful, indeed the ultimate tool in overcoming medicine's rather dismal history over the centuries of error and misconceptions and harms. <clears throat> now, as you know, control trials enroll populations of participants, and generally the bigger the better, into intervention and control groups. <clears throat> and they do that in order to detect whether the therapy involved has a true impact. <clears throat> 
So uh, why do trialists go to all this trouble rather than simply studying the effect of the, the therapy in single persons, the so-called N of 1 trials? Well, basically they do that because single, <coughs> excuse me, single persons often seem to respond to a test or a drug or a procedure that actually doesn't work. <coughs> in other words, a false positive response. And single persons often don't respond to clinical interventions that actually do work, a false negative response. <clears throat> Bad news for population studies is that populations are multifarious. That is, the false responses in individual participants are mixed in with the true responses. And the false responses therefore create noise in the sense that they interfere with the detection of true responses, which would be the signal. The good news for population studies is that in general, the overall signal from the true responses in whole populations generally outweighs the noise from false responses. <clears throat> and which is, and that's the reason why clinical researchers do rely on population studies. What's more, studies in populations also make it possible to measure the amount of impact of an intervention, that is to say, effect size. So let's look at an example of such a population-based trial. We'll assume a hypothetical cardiac disease, call it intermittent cardiac apoplexy, or ICA. Now this disease carries a substantial mortality risk if you're hospitalized for an exacerbation. And what we want to know in this trial is whether treatment whether, with a new intervention, call it drug X, and it could, that could be test X or device X or procedure X, truly lowers the death rate in patients hospitalized with ICA, and if so, by how much? So we carry out a simultaneous uh, two-arm parallel randomized controlled trial of drug X in a sizable population of hospitalized patients with ICA. And the mortality rate drops from, say, um, eight events to six per 100 patients with an acceptably small variance. Statistically speaking, this confirms that drug X, quote, really works. And the point estimate of the absolute mortality risk reduction in treated patients in our study population is two percentage points. You might say that the result from a population study like this is like looking down at the earth from say 40,000 feet. You can tell there's a city there, but you can't make out individual buildings. And results like uh, these make a lot of people happy, <clears throat> particularly the company that manufactures drug X, and they made us happy as the editors of Annals. <clears throat> but over time, I come to realize that the results in populations, as important as they are, don't really meet the information needs of providers. And more to the point, population studies don't really meet the needs of the most important person in healthcare, which is, of course, the individual patient sitting in our office or lying in the bed across from us. So call the patient in our office, Ms. Moneypenny. Now two things you need to know about Ms. Moneypenny. First, she has ICA. And second, she's very smart. Now, Ms. Moneypenny learns about the results of our trial and she says, well, that's interesting, but my biology and behavior are different from those of most other people. And so what I need to know <clears throat> as an ICA patient is well, will I benefit from drug X to the same extent as the group as a whole? Well, the easy answer to her question is yes, that's a reasonable assumption. And most of us frequently and unthinkingly make that assumption most of the time. Unfortunately, unfortunately that assumption is simplistic. It's what the epidemiologists call the ecological fallacy. And they call it that, first, because it's unwarranted a priori to assume that individual members of a population will respond to an intervention in the same way and to the same extent as the whole group. And more importantly, they usually don't, as we'll see. 
Not, not surprisingly, researchers often are intensing, intensely curious to know whether their population study actually does contain what we might call the heterogeneity of treatment effect. That is, whether the response to a particular treatment really differs among individual patients or participants in the trial. And the way researchers usually go about this is that after a trial is done, they segregate out subgroups from the population, each identified by one distinguishing characteristic, age or sex or ethnicity or presence of comorbidities, etc. And then they analyze the impact of the intervention on a chosen outcome in each subgroup. Now, the impulse to do subgroup analyses is usually well-intentioned, but it's also risky for two main reasons. The first reason is because post hoc analyses done in this way uh, are so easily influenced by what the person doing them hopes or expects to find. <clears throat> And that's why subgroup analyses done this way are sometimes referred to as torturing the data until it, <coughs> me, until it tells you what you want to hear. <coughs> the second reason they're risky is because if anyone pokes around in a data set long enough, they're likely to find new but spurious results purely by the play of chance. And that's why subgroup analyses done this way are sometimes also called fishing expeditions. <clears throat> Besides, subgroup analyses that define subgroups by using a single variable are generally dis disappointing because they rarely turn up clinically meaningful differences in outcome between the subgroup <clears throat> and the whole study population. <clears throat> so for all these reasons, post hoc subgroup analyses are viewed with dark suspicion by clinical researchers and methodologists and statisticians, and they're very much discouraged. So that leaves us in a uh, highly uncomfortable state of cognitive dissonance, namely, that on, because on the one hand, we recognize that the ecological fallacy is a real and substantial problem. But on the other hand, we have no intellectually sound way to capture the heterogeneity of treatment effect. And therefore, we don't have a useful way to back translate from treatment effects in population studies to treatment effects in individual patients. <clears throat> so it's been encouraging <clears throat> to have an analytic uh, technique called risk stratification come along in recent years. And this technique seems to offer uh, a realistic hope of giving us reliable insight into the heterogeneity of treatment effect. It's mainly the work of David Kent at Tufts and Rod Hayward at Michigan, and they've been joined in recent years by researchers from several other institutions. Now, risk stratification starts from the premise that the heterogeneity of treatment effect stems from a small number of clearly defined sources. And the most important of these are, first, the biological and behavioral, the behavioral variation of individual patients, which determine the likelihood that a given patient in the untreated state will experience a particular outcome of a disease that we're interested in. And the second source is treatment-related harm, which can neutralize the benefit from treatment and even cause net harm. There are a couple of more sources of this heterogeneity. We know less about them, and we won't talk about them today. One is competing risk, which is to say a different disease simultaneously present in the, in the same patient that produces the same outcome, and uh, direct modification of the treatment effect by uh, extraneous uh, influences. Now, risk stratification also postulates that clinically meaningful variation in outcome is not determined by any single factor, but by combinations of multiple biological and behavioral factors. A familiar example is uh, that age and sex and hypertension and hypercholesterolemia and smoking and obesity and diabetes, etc., all contribute collectively 
to the risk of myocardial infarction of stroke. So given these premises, how do you actually carry out a risk stratified analysis? Well, the first step is to sort trial participants into subgroups with higher and lower risk for the primary outcome if they're not treated. Now, this risk, as, uh, risk estimate is uh, based on multiple, not single risk factors. And it's calculated using multivariable modeling. Now, David Kent and his co-authors started doing this sorting and found something really interesting. <clears throat> what they found was that the actual calculated differences between outcome risks in the lowest versus the highest risk groups in populations in a variety of disease states are anything but trivial. <clears throat> They're often as high as 20 to 50-fold and occasionally as much as 100-fold. The second step in doing a risk stratification analysis is to use the actual doubt outcomes data for each risk subgroup, high, medium, low, risk, deciles, whatever, to calculate <clears throat> relative and absolute risk reduction for being treated. Now, just to remind you, relative risk reduction is a fraction. The numerator is the decrease in event rate in treated patients. And the denominator is the event rate in untreated patients. Absolute risk reduction, in contrast, is simply the difference in outcome rates between treated and untreated patients. And it's expressed as, usually as the number of percentage points the event rate is decreased in treated patients compared with untreated patients. Now for individual patients and providers, Absolute risk reduction is thought to be the more meaningful number. Number, it's, it's simpler, it's less abstract, and it's more directly related to the value of treatment. Now, this table <clears throat> shows what the results of a risk stratification analysis actually look like. Uh, this is a slightly modified hypothetical example <clears throat> from Kent and his colleagues. The first row shows the results for the whole population in a traditional clinical study. And you can see that the relative risk reduction, which is the RRR column, for the chosen outcome in the treatment population as a whole is about 0.25 or a 25% risk reduction. The accompanying absolute risk reduction, or ARR, <clears throat> is two percentage points, PP or 0.2 if you express it as a probability. An absolute risk reduction like this means you'd need to treat 50 patients in order for one to benefit. And this is the so-called number needed to treat, or NNT, which is here, 50. Now, in the second row, we get into the risk stratification analysis. You can see the, the, uh, here the effect of treatment in a subgroup whose risk for mor mortality is low if they remain untreated. And not so incidentally, low-risk patients are often in the majority in clinical trials. The absolute risk reduction in this treatment, low-risk treatment subgroup is only one percentage point, which is to say half of the two points reduction that was found in the overall treatment population. And the corresponding number needed to treat has now jumped from 50 up to 100. The clinical implications of results like these in low-risk subgroups are very interesting, very immediate, and very important at two levels, one being the level of clinical decision-making by both providers and patients, and the second being uh, the level of the economics of healthcare. Now, the effect on clinical decision-making of this kind of analysis was brought home to me by my sister. And she called me a couple of years ago from England, where she lives. And she'd read a report in one of the British newspapers about the results of a patient-level meta-analysis on aspirin as a primary prevention for cardiovascular events. And this was a meta-analysis published in The Lancet in 2009. And um, 
this this analysis resulted to a, uh, amounted to a risk stratified analysis, although they used a slightly different technique. And the authors, uh, in their conclusions, said, and I quote: "In primary prevention, the net absolute reduction from low dose aspirin." in disabling or fatal occlusive events is likely to be small and at least partially offset by a small increase in serious intracranial and extracranial bleeds. Now, my sister had been taking low-dose aspirin preventively and she was worried about whether to keep taking it and in light of this risk stratified analysis her concern does seem pretty reasonable. Now, as to the economic implications, as you all know, health care costs are breaking the bank in the U.S. and elsewhere, and the cost of drugs is an increasing burden. So it was noteworthy, whether or not you agree with the commentary, that a commentary in the New York Times on March 7th of this year said the following, and I quote, we need to separate out those who benefit from a drug and those who don't. When a drug works, patients and insurance companies should pay the full price. When it doesn't, they should pay nothing. So now let's uh, turn to the third line of this table, and they show the results in the high-risk subgroup of this treatment population in our trial. The untreated event rate here you can see is 20 times higher than in the low-risk subgroup, 80 versus 4. The relative risk reduction is still 25%. That's not always true in clinical trials in real life. It often differs from the uh, relative risk reduction in the whole population, but usually not by much. The absolute risk reduction, on the other hand, is 10 times greater than in the treatment group as a whole, 20 versus 2, and 20 times greater than in the low-risk subgroup. 20 versus 1. And the corresponding number needed to treat in the high-risk subgroup is now only 5. Now, Kent, David Kent and his colleagues did risk stratified analyses on the data from trials in seven major clinical areas. And the results are summarized on this slide. What they found was the treatment benefit was demonstrable for the population as a whole in every disease area. But at the same time, in these studies, the low, lowest risk participant subgroup in every area received minimal or zero clinically meaningful therapeutic benefit. So in summary, risk stratification does seem to be a major innovation with uh, great potential but it's also important to emphasize that it's not easy to do, and that's mainly because the multivariable risk factor calculations are a lot of work and hard to do well. So let's return now to our patient, Ms. Moneypenny. She's heard about this technique of risk stratification, and she begins to wonder about the worst-case scenario for herself. In effect, she says, well, what if my biology and behavior put me at the highest risk of dying if I were hospitalized for an episode of ICA? So she consults a clinical epidemiologist friend who does a risk stratification analysis of our trial results for drug X. And given her risk factors, Ms. Moneypenny turns out to be in the highest risk subgroup. So if she needed it, her absolute benefit from drug X would be 20 percentage points, much higher than the two percentage points across the board benefit for the treated ICA population as a whole. And you might say, uh, therefore, that risk stratification gives her a much more fine-grained picture of her personal therapeutic benefit from drug X than the po population study the original population study does. It, it, in other words, it's a little bit like a, a view of the Earth from, say, a thousand feet relative, compared to 40,000 feet. And from a thousand feet, you can see individual buildings in the city. Well, so far, so good, but Ms. Moneypenny is now concerned because she knows 
that she'll be treated in the hustle and bustle of everyday practice in her local hospital, not under the artificial and rigidly controlled conditions of a clinical trial. And she's heard, for example, that despite the fact that something like preoperative antibiotics are known to be effective in reducing surgical site infection, the actual rate of pre-op antibiotic administration to the right patients in the right way at the right time usually isn't 100%. Uh, and it can be as low as 70 to 80% in some hospitals. So she looks into the ICA treatment situation in her local hospitals. She starts with the nearest one, General Hospital. And she's dismayed to find that under the usual care delivered there, only 40% of high-risk patients admitted with ICA actually get drug X. Now, of course, if she actually wound up in the hospital and actually got drug X in general hospital, her benefit, her absolute risk reduction, would be a 20% percentage point lower risk of dying. But in the real world, her overall start-to-finish probability of benefiting from drug X going into General Hospital wouldn't be 20 percentage points because the likelihood she'd actually get the drug isn't 100%. And the result would be a large voltage drop in benefit, so to speak. And her absolute risk reduction going in would therefore be more like 8 percentage points. And at the same time, Ms. Moneypenny has heard encouraging reports about other hospitals in the city trying to change the way they do things to correct for gaps and limitations and deficiencies in the usual care. And they call these efforts quality improvement. So she checks with another hospital, community hospital, across town. And she's encouraged at what she finds because although the previous administration of drug X at community hospital for high-risk ICA patients was only 40 percent, the staff have been really successful in improving the rate. It's now 95 percent. Now, it isn't clear why they've been so successful, hence the question marks on the slide, but we'll get back to that. But the overall probability of therapeutic benefit Ms. Money can expect from drug X going into community hospital would be 19 percentage points, close to the best level obtainable for high-risk patients with ICA, and a lot better than the 8 percentage points in general hospital. So now Ms. Penny is really curious about this whole quality improvement business. So she checks with a third hospital, call it proprietary hospital, and they're also trying to change the process by which they administer drug X. And she's surprised and disappointed to find that the staff have only been able to increase the rate of drug X administration from 40% up to 60% of eligible high-risk ICA patients. And the reasons for these uh, frustrating results are also not clear, hence the question marks. But the end result is that the overall probability of therapeutic benefit for her from drug X going into proprietary hospital would be about 12 percentage points. That's better than the eight percentage points of benefit under usual care in general hospital, but considerably less than the 19 percentage points benefit in the more dedicated and persistent community hospital. Now this leads Ms. Moneypenny to the intriguing conclusion that just as there's a meaningful heterogeneity of treatment effect for tests and drugs and procedures, there's an important variation in the effectiveness of programs that are designed to improve quality and safety. And we could call that the heterogeneity of improvement effect. Now, the literature makes it clear that the heterogeneity of improvement effect is uh, common and a substantial effect. For example, although the available evidence isn't all that strong, the published literature makes it pretty clear that the effectiveness of rapid response team systems varies quite widely from hospital to hospital. And this leads Ms. Moneypenny to ask, well, where does the heterogeneity of improvement effect come from? 
Well, the answer uh, isn't really clear, but it's likely related to the following realities. <clears throat> First, all improvement in healthcare involves making changes, although not all changes are improvement, as the improvement professionals like to say. And second, because healthcare is ultimately delivered by people, individual providers and groups. So the main thing that needs to change if the quality and safety of care are going to get better is human performance or human behavior. And third, the things that change human performance are generally social tools. So what is it about social tools that causes the impact of improvement in interventions to vary from site to site? Well, first, the interventions themselves are almost always made up of multiple components. And the individual components are not only difficult to standardize, but they can be mixed and matched. And so the mix can be extremely variable from place to place and from time to time. For example, um, the intervention that was so successful in reducing catheter-related bloodstream infection in the now well-known Michigan ICU program included the many elements that are seen on this slide. In their own words, the organizers and leaders of this project did many different things to achieve the result they did. Look at all the verbs. They recruited advocates. They kept the team focused. They created alliances. They shifted power relationships. They developed incentives, they opened channels, and they used audit and feedback. Secondly, uh, improvement interventions, like all social, social change tools, don't act directly. In order to work, they first have to be absorbed. That is to say, they have to be understood and remembered and accepted. Buy-in is crucial. And then they are almost always adapted to fit the local circumstances. And this overall process of absorption is sometimes referred to as adaptive work. So in the Michigan Central Line Infection Control Project, the organizers and leaders initially introduced a single checklist to be used by the staff. But the adaptive work by the staff led to the development of about, quote, 100 different checklists in the 103 different ICUs that participated. And it's also worth mentioning at this point that once people absorb an intervention, a social intervention like this, it's quite easy for them to spread it. Um, and that, that could be an asset if you want your intervention to be widely adopted. But it's a liability if you're trying to study an intervention's effectiveness, as we'll see. Third, inter improvement interventions are inherently context dependent. And that is to say the way they work is by interacting with the social and organizational context. And in the process, they get woven into the fabric of that organizational context. So it gets harder and harder to distinguish them as an external agent or force. And therefore you can't control the context out when you're studying the efficacy of a particular social intervention. An organizational context varies widely from place to place. And finally, improvement interventions are unstable. They're unstable by design. They're designed to change because the way they keep getting more effective is by being refined over time in response to feedback. And this overall process sometimes is referred to as reflexiveness. Now, Ms. Moneypenny is, uh, is impressed by this multifarious composition of improvement interventions and um, improvement sites. But at the same time, she's concerned that all this heterogeneity might create noise that would make it hard, if not impossible, to know whether an improvement intervention actually works at all. Now, this is crucially important. And there's, there seem to be two main approaches to dealing with it. First, people can use true experimental methods, study methods, which they sometimes get referred to as enumerative methods, 
to study the efficacy of improvement interventions, just the way these uh, true experimental methods are used to study traditional clinical interventions. And um, the, the question asked uh, in this kind of study is, is, does the intervention really work? Um, <clears throat> but just as with, just as the question is asked with tests and drugs and procedures, but since social change mechanisms spread so easily, such studies need to be particularly carefully designed to limit, quote, contamination of the control group by the intervention. Now, two study designs that can help to minimize the so-called contamination of the control group are cluster randomized trials and stepped wedge trial designs. Studies using these designs uh, can be done and have been done with improvement interventions, but they're to set up, they're difficult, carry out, they're time consuming, and can be quite expensive. Maybe more discouraging is that they're not always successful in preventing contamination. A second alternative approach is to use quasi experimental methods, primarily time series study designs. And these are sometimes known as analytical methods. Analytical me studies are based on the theory of statistical process control, and they appear to be rapidly becoming the favored method for investigating improvement interventions. And that's partly because analytical studies are generally faster and more feasible to carry out than control trials, but partly because if they're carefully done, analytical studies also have an important theoretical advantage over the enumerative approach. And that's mainly because time is included as an essential dimension in analytical studies. And time is very difficult to deal with in enumerative studies. So assuming it's been established that a particular improvement intervention can work, Ms. Moneypenny asks the next question, which is, how can you find out for whom it works and under what circumstances and how? In other words, how can you best pinpoint the sources of heterogeneity of improvement effect? There doesn't seem to be a good name yet for this important process, but whatever it's called, it's going to inevitably involve figuring out what factors, what aspects of the intervention itself and the context facilitate performance change and what factors obstruct it. So until a better label comes along, we can call it something like change factor analysis. And you can see that this is analogous to risk stratification in the sense that both tease out the effects of heterogeneity on responsiveness. Now, although they're not called that, and a fairly impressive number of what amount to change factor analysis reports are now being published. So we'll finish with a few examples of such studies. Now, these uh, change factor analyses generally use what's called a positive deviance approach, which is to say they try to learn from patterns of success rather than learning from mistakes. Although learning from mistakes is also a uh, time-honored and important way to change things for the better, it's sometimes known in improvement circles as the doctrine of Kaizen, which says that every defect is a treasure. Now, in this first study, researchers from the Michigan Central Line Infection Control Project formulated what they called an ex post theory of why the intervention seemed to work so well. And these theories, or this theory, is, uh, are uh, listed on this, this slide. Now, it's true that there was a technical component to the intervention, a technical care bundle, which included proper draping of the patient, changing to the most effective skin prep solution, and making an equipment cart available. But the real research question seemed to me to be, well, what were the social change mechanisms that persuaded the staff to develop and use this bundle every time with every patient? The researchers formulated a theory of these change mechanisms at a detail, or what you might say, they call a sub-process or on-the-ground level as listed here. 
the leaders and the staff applied pressure to join the project. They formed a community of participating units. They reframed infections as a social problem. They shaped a culture of commitment to the project. They harnessed data as discipline. And they used what they called social and administrative hard edges to reinforce adherence to the care bundle. Now, this second change factor analysis was an in-depth on-site field study. Uh, the researchers examined the organizational policies and practices, practices in what you might call uh, a mid-level of abstraction. <clears throat> and they compared the existing policies and practices in hospitals that had the lowest versus those with the highest risk standardized mortality rates for myocardial infarction patients. And they found that first that AMI, that is to say acute myocardial infarction specific bedside protocols and practices, including aspirin and beta blocker use and time to reperfusion, didn't distinguish the lowest from the highest performing groups. But the social and cultural, cultural factors listed here did. Values and goals, involvement of senior management, staff presence and expertise in AMI care, communication and coordination among the staff, and staff commitment to problem solving and learning. Finally, the uh, social scientist Paul Bate and his colleagues in England uh, have carried out an impressive set of on-site field studies of several high-performing health systems in the US and the UK. And by high-performing, they mean uh, outstanding care in one or more areas. And they distilled in these studies, they distilled out six high-level challenges or factors that contributed to high-quality care in every site. And these six areas or challenges uh, were particularly the structural, cultural, and political challenges, but also educational, emotional, and physical slash technological uh, processes. Now, no single process or factor accounted for the high quality care, nor did any dominant set of factors. There, were, there seemed to be no silver bullet. In every site they studied, the development of high quality care in the area studied had required contributions from all six factors. Which raises an important and puzzling question. Since these same six factors appear to be universally present, how can they explain variation in improvement from site to site? So Bate and his colleagues puzzled about this question, and they finally were led to what they called the universal but variable thesis, which is that the factors that contribute to delivery of safe and high quality care are broadly the same everywhere. So the explanation for the heterogeneity of improvement effect must lie in what they called the intricate dynamic network of interactions among the multiplicity of sub-processes within these six broad factors or areas of challenge, rather than the bald challenges themselves. And they use the metaphor of, of the cityscape uh, to try to make this more concrete. And they, by what, by what, they, what they meant by that was that all cities had the same elements, buildings, road systems, parks, business districts, etc. But every city is instantly recognizable as unique through its particular combination of elements. And the skyline of the city is a, is a good example. So to summarize, I hope I've persuaded you that although biological and behavioral heterogeneity is an important and frustrating source of noise in clinical science, it's also an essential and unique source of information for understanding which particular patients will benefit most and which least from what we have to offer them. And I hope I've persuaded you that although heterogeneity of social change factors gets in the way of knowing whether an improvement intervention can work, it also provides an essential and unique signal for understanding why the efforts to change healthcare delivery for the better succeed in some places, but not in others. <clears throat>
So in both clinical and improvement science, heterogeneity turns out to be an important but greatly underused source of knowledge. In fact, it's arguably the case that not tapping into the rich heterogeneity that's present in clinical trials um, or in trials of improvement interventions wastes enormous amounts of important information, which in a way you could see as being essentially an unethical uh, problem. The main reason we're wasting this heterogeneity information is because we're still not smart enough to figure out how to read what heterogeneity has to tell us. So an everyday lesson from all of this for all of us might be as follows. Whenever uh, we're involved in improving safety and quality of care delivery, it behooves us to get extremely skilled as uh, observers of what's being done, where it's being done, and how it's being done watching and listening very carefully all the time, recording what we observe, writing it down, keeping a journal, making notes, possibly even videotaping certain aspects of it. Then going beyond just recording and begin, beginning to reflect on what's happening or not in the sense of asking questions, digging around. Why is something working? Why isn't it? How can we make it work better? And going beyond that, to begin to develop mental models or hypotheses about mechanisms, read, uh, particularly in other disciplines, uh, and, and particularly the best of social science. And finally, share your thinking. Talk about what you've seen, what you think, debate it, present it at seminars and meetings, critique it, publish it. And remember, you might just be one of the people who helps to develop the techniques that we really need for reading heterogeneity. So I'll stop there and open things up for questions, but before that I have a couple of housekeeping items. First here are some useful references that get into depth on what we've talked about today. And second, <clears throat> I need to acknowledge the people whose comments helped me to put together the presentation. So I'll hand it back over to Bill. I understand that there are questions from people who've been watching and listening, and I'll be happy to try to respond to them. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for that. So we have a question for you straight away, which is, uh, your patient, Miss Moneypenny, seems to be extraordinarily well-connected uh, and able to navigate her way around the system. From the patient end of all of this, what are the, what are the implications of this uh, very, very complex issue you've raised? I think we're just beginning to understand what the implications might be. I suppose in an ideal world, patients would have um, begun to learn uh, something about these differences. But I think in the shorter term, there need to be interpreters and people who will help make these translations between uh, trial data and the meaning for patients. Of course, clinicians do this every day just in an ad hoc way because they have to but it's done in a very informal way and i think we're just really beginning to understand the more detailed um kind of approach to doing it okay thanks frank now we've got a, another question here from uh, from michigan with 103 icus in michigan should it not be possible to capitalize on variation by examining in each icu the degree to which a particular components of the multi-factor intervention were implemented, and B, the degree to which peer pressure to engage in the problem was felt and therefore reported? Well, that, that's certainly possible in theory. There are a number of groups that are beginning to try to do this kind of on the ground, detailed sort of qualitative analysis of how uh, organizations and staffs and units differ. Yeah, it can be done, but it's uh, we're just learning, just learning how to do that. I think it, it's it's a in a sense a branch of social science, and um, most of us in trained in medicine weren't really trained in social science, so we're just uh, kind of beginning to take advantage of that kind of work. All right, um, another question for you now: um, Does risk stratification weaken or invalidate the results of clinical trials? I don't see the, the technique as weakening the overall results of trials. Quite the contrary. I, I see 
risk stratification is essentially enriching the conclusions that are drawn from tr clinical trials. Uh, Kent and Hayward do make the point that, for example, a clinical trial which overall shows no apparent therapeutic benefit if it's reanalyzed from the risk stratification point of view, might actually turn out to demonstrate uh, one or more subgroups uh, which did benefit in a meaningful way and, in, in effect, convert that trial from being a so-called negative one to a positive one. It's a little like in the mining industry having a, a kind of ore that in previously was uh, looked like it was not productive. A, a new way of refining it is discovered, and all of a sudden uh, a new kind of product is available. That's a, that's a really helpful metaphor. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, here from England. Um, it goes like this. Clinicians and managers tend to migrate towards either the methods of evaluation of clinical interventions or those of quality, intervent quality improvement interventions, but few have understanding or desire to understand both. How can we bring these two worlds together? Well, uh, I suppose looking back at the slides that show the the uh, drift, so to speak, of benefit from the overall trial through the risk stratification to the actual implementation, uh, in a way, does begin to bring those together uh, in an actual quantitative way. Whether that will turn out to be a useful exercise, I'm not sure. There is a risk of, of risk stratification in the sense that um, the, the, the discovery that there can be so much variation within uh, a trial population does lend itself to people uh, rushing out and, and, and digging around to find variations that really turn out to be not meaningful. And, and that's, that's something that has to be guarded against. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, here, and it is this. How might researchers distinguish what's particular to a situation from what is generally interesting? In other words, what happens to the notion of research generalizability here? Yeah, the, the, um, the implications of risk stratification for generalizability are fairly profound. Um, it, and, and I'm not sure that there's a simple answer. Uh, I think generalizability has always been a very tricky area, and the Campbell and Stanley, who were sort of the two of the original gurus in trying to define the uh, most powerful uh, evidence supporting cause-effect relationships, um, uh, pointed out how difficult it is to deal with generalizability um, in comparison with, uh, with uh, cause-effect relationships, which are, are more statistically uh, manageable somehow. So I, I'm not sure I could give a simple answer to the generalizability issue. Okay. A uh, question now from uh, New Jersey, uh, from a colleague of ours. How important is felt peer pressure for quality improvement generally, in your experience, Frank? Uh, 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 this turns out to be uh, important across a wide variety of human behaviors, and uh, uh, what about medicine? Well, there certainly has been growing peer pressure for quality improvement, um, it runs into the difficulty that uh, um, the whole range of different kinds of improvement efforts in industry and organizations generally have come along, the sort of the flavor of the month kind of thing, many of which turn out to be a lot of work and don't be very productive, and um, that has been discouraging. Um, so uh, I guess the basic, the, the bottom line is that we're still um, learning how to take advantage of the various approaches to improvement, some of which will work better than others, and we have to try not to get too discouraged when they don't work. Thank you. Um, another question here. Uh, why did David Kent's group do most of their risk stratification studies on therapies for cardiovascular disease, Frank? Well, that, that's fairly striking, and I think you may have noticed that I think six out of the seven areas that were shown on that slide were in cardiovascular disease, and I suppose uh, my own sense is that that's because there's better data on the multivariable influences on risk in the area of cardiology, partly starting with studies like the Framingham study, which kind of put multivariable risk factors onto the map. Increasingly, though, I think multivariable kinds of risk um, data are beginning to be available, and they actually advocate that 
uh, when randomized trials are done, that this kind of information be included uh, right from the beginning in the planning and the execution of the study. Um, Frank, here's another. In your BMGA quality and safety paper, you touch on the increased scholarly interest in case reports. Could you say a little bit more about this? Well, case reports have a checkered history in, in medicine. They've been the basis for much of clinical teaching. Um, they were the basis for much of the published literature for many years. If you look back at the publications 50 and 100 years ago, case reports and case series were mostly what was published. And they've fallen out of favor because of the extraordinary power of population studies and statistical analyses, particularly true experimental study designs. But there really are um, important um, aspects to clinical case studies that are that add value. Uh, that again, the area of case studies and what they bring to evidence is, is just re-emerging. I think it's partly related to um, using case studies to highlight uh, unexpected effects and then pursue the, the reasons for those unexpected effects. Thank you. Uh, a great question here now. Um, if clinical practice moves towards personalized medicine, where do you see organizational quality improvement going? I think organizational quality improvement, in a sense, is sort of the analog of personal, personalized medicine because individual institutions do have some resemblances to each other, but um, from the point of view of quality improvement, it, it's the differences among them that really seem to be where the, where the mother load of, of useful information will come from. Uh, there, there's some value to both similarities and differences, but the differences part is beginning to emerge as a uh, particularly powerful tool in understanding um, you know, where things could be made better. Frank, uh, why do analytical studies have potential advantages over enumerative studies? Well, the way, the way I see it, uh, analytical studies, um, as I said in the, in the talk, um, uh, do incorporate the dimension of time into the analysis uh, as an intrinsic part of it. Uh, and in effect, every point on a time series becomes a little mini trial. And if you have a whole series of little mini trials that show stability over time, and then all of a sudden that um, uh, outcome begins to change and remains stable at a different level, that's really a powerful predictive instrument uh, of the effectiveness of something being maintained over time rather than just pointing to a snapshot of before and after where you can't tell looking ahead whether that after level will, will persist. So I think in, in, the, in a kind of general way that's uh, where a lot of the power from analytical studies comes from. Frank, thank you so much. Just uh, one last very general question before we close. Uh, uh, in your conclusion, you pose a number of questions to us. Uh, if you were an idealist and an optimist, uh, where would we be on this topic in 10 years' time from now? I think it's um, uh, inevitable that we'll be moving in this direction um, because I think that the, the, the move toward personalized medicine and improvement is based essentially on... Um, uh, recognizing individual differences. So I think that, that's, uh, that, that we, we'll move in that direction. There'll be fits and starts, but uh, I think that it's, uh, it's going to be a, a very exciting time and probably very productive. So we've come to the end of our time together. It just remains for me to thank you all for participating, for your many questions, and most of all for me to thank Frank for making such complex ideas so clear and for challenging all of our thinking. Thank you, Frank. I do hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Our next one will give you a chance to hear more about the Health Foundation's International Scan of Improvement Science Centres. We'll email all of you with the date very shortly. Thank you, and goodbye.